Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Hedrick. Welcome to Grace Bible Truth. This is part six of the Pentecostalism series, The Truth About Pentecostalism. First of all, I want to say thank you to those of you who have subscribed to our channel, and we hope we have been a blessing and encouragement to you uh, through the teaching of the Word of God. And we also want to say thanks to those of you who have emailed us and responded with your sincere comments. We want to say thank you. If you haven't subscribed, we encourage you to do so. Um, push the like button and the bell to be notified when we put out a new video. And I also want to say um, that we have been really busy um, it has taken a while now to put out a new video, and the reason is that I do work a full-time job, and we are in the process of selling our home, and we are trying to move closer uh, to our church, which is about two hours away. And so we've been really busy, and I want to apologize um, for not getting um, a video out sooner. But uh, Lord willing, um, hopefully we'll be able to someday do this full time. Today we want to define backsliding biblically and also to answer the question, can a believer lose his or her salvation? Can a believer lose his or her salvation? Now in Pentecostalism, their definition of backsliding is when the person forfeits his or her salvation because the person has fallen back into sin. Or in other words, if a person is considered backslid, they're not attending church like they were before, they're not paying their tithes, um, they have been disobedient in some way and, and maybe even have quit the church. And if this is the case, it is believed that they are backslid and they need to be saved again. That's the conclusion that uh, they come to. So Pentecostals believe that the person they saw every Sunday that worshiped alongside them and they witnessed them speaking in tongues, um, they believe that person was truly saved because of that. And in the process of time, because of disobedience, no doubt, or defection in the person's life, their understanding is the person has backslid, or he must be backslid, and he needs to be saved again. So according to this theology, they would first be given salvation and eternal life, then in their backslidden condition, abandon salvation and eternal life, and then come back for salvation and eternal life again, of which they had lost the first time because of sin. Friends, the Bible does not teach this, okay? This is something um, we actually saw on a regular basis when we were in um, the holiness movement. Some would supposedly get saved every revival in camp meeting, but we know now that that is actually not what was happening. The independent holiness movement especially believes if after professing to be a believer, you are found committing sin, they believe you have lost your salvation and must be saved all over again. They believe if you are a Christian, you will not sin. And if you are found sinning after you've been saved, they believe you have backslid and you need to be born again all over again. Now, no one will say it directly, but this is what they believe and teach because I was in it for 24 years before coming out. Look, this is bad theology. It's not what the Bible teaches. This belief system is flawed and it is incorrect. This theology comes about by the uh, misinterpreting of Scripture and uh, primarily holding to an Arminian view of soteriology. Friends, there is a great danger, as I've said before, in, in holding to an Arminian view of soteriology and a Pentecostal view of pneumatology. Um, 
if we would give an example, this comes from verses like chapter 3 of 1 John, where the Bible speaks of practicing sin, being of the devil, and whoever is born of God doesn't continue practicing sin. And we believe this is true because it's what the Bible says. But we must understand this chapter is speaking of habitual sin. Now remember, we can't take one or two scriptures without rightly dividing the scripture, using the whole of scripture, and defining what the scripture actually means compared to other Bible verses that speak about sin. Okay? Remember that. Because there are other places in scripture that speak of believers committing sin. And... According to scripture, if a believer sins, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that is found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. This is what it says. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The error is somehow sin, repentance, and backsliding, and losing one's salvation has been interpreted to mean something it doesn't mean. And when you are Arminian in theology, the whole Bible can be interpreted incorrectly in just about any subject. And that's a fact. This is why I don't understand why anyone could hold to an Arminian view of soteriology or a Pentecostal view of pneumatology, and especially if you know anything about church history. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the definition of sin and the different ways in which Scripture speaks of sin, repentance and backsliding, to see whether or not one really loses his or her salvation. So first of all, what is sin and how is it defined in Scripture? All right, 1 John, uh, 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So sin is defined here as the transgression of the law of God. In fact, in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it is defined biblically as sin is any want of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. John MacArthur also states sin is any personal lack of conformity to the moral character of God or the law of God. And it actually means the same thing, just said in a different way. So biblically, it is any violation or disobedience to the law of God. That's sin. Now, the Bible speaks of what is called, or what we call the sins of commission and the sins of omission. Um, also, it speaks of presumptuous sin and also secret sin. And there is a defining difference in these words. Let's first look at the difference in the sins of commission and the sins of omission. All right, the sin of commission is when we openly rebel and are disobedient to God in thought, word, or deed. And yes, sometimes believers do this and must repent and ask forgiveness. A believer doesn't lose the free gift of salvation Christ gave them. They just need to repent of the sin of commission or the sin of omission. Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden by eating the forbidden fruit that God said not to eat from, that was the sin of commission. Um, in 1 John 5, 17, sin is defined as all wrongdoing. The scripture says, all unrighteousness is sin. So the things that come from the heart and mind that are contrary to the law of God and the nature of God, to think evil, act evil, speak evil, and do the opposite of what is right, is sin. So sin is everything which does not conform to the holy law of God. Now, in James 4, 17, we have what is called the sin of omission, okay? The sin of omission is a sin that 
comes about as a result of not doing right when we should have. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. So uh, the sin of omission is when you don't pray and you know you should have. When you don't study the Bible and you know you should. When you didn't take a stand for what was right and true and you should have. When you didn't treat your neighbor right. When you didn't help your neighbor or love your neighbor as yourself. And you know that you're supposed to. That is the sin of omission. And the list just goes on and on of all the things that you didn't do that you should have done. Um, the story of the Good Samaritan is a great example of the sin of omission. And let's look at that in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. Jesus said, he, Jesus said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves which stripped him of his clothes, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. Now notice that. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. Notice that, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, when he departed, he took he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said to him, Take care of him and whatever you spend more. When I come again, I will repay you. Now, in this story, we have two men who did not do what was right. Now, if you, if you were paying attention, the priest and the Levite both committed the sin of omission. All right, James 14, 17 again. When you know to do right, when you know to do good and you don't do it, it is sin. Now, what we must understand is these are sins that believers do all the time, which is why some teach that we sin every day. Um, there are things we are to do for Christ that we don't always do. And we think, well, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It's sin. We are to be faithful and consistent in prayer. You don't always do it. We're to read and study the Bible faithfully, but faithfully, but we don't always do it, right? We're to love our neighbor as ourselves, but we don't always do it. And again, the list goes on of all the things that we should have done that we didn't do. Uh, I like what Paul Warsher stated. The believer is not sinless, but he will sin less as his relationship with Christ grows, end quote. So the sin of commission is doing something you shouldn't have, and the sin of omission is not doing what you should have. Now, I also want to mention something else here because it's very important. In a general application, it's true that if a person knows to do right and he doesn't do it, he's guilty of wrongdoing. He's guilty of sin. That's what the Bible teaches. Um, that's what it says. But I want to share with you James 14, 7, or James 4, 17 in context. Come now you who say tomorrow or today we're going to go into such a town and we're going to spend there maybe a year or so and trade and, and, and make profit. Yet you don't know what tomorrow will bring. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. For that you ought to have said, if the Lord will, we will live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. And then the verse says, Therefore, to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. All right, so here we have 
the writer in context, speaking of um, bragging about the future without considering the uncertainty of life and remembering that God is in control and only what he has sovereignly decreed will come to pass, you see? And so if we're making plans recklessly without considering God's plan for our future, we are guilty of sin. Friends, this is things believers do at times in their life. So sin is any action, feeling, or thought that goes against God's standards. Now, there are many sins uh, mentioned in the Bible, but for the sake of time, I do want to look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and also Galatians 5, those two things. All right, Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them nor serve them for the Lord your God is a jealous God inflicting punishment on the fathers, on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing favor to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. All right, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, male slave, female slave, um, his ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, this is an example of commands in the Bible, laws, that if um, they did not keep, they committed sin. All right, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Let's Look at that list there. Now the works of the flesh are made clear or manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I told you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, okay? So we have another list of sins here. Now the question we want to answer is, is it possible for a believer to sin after he has been born again? Is it possible for a believer to fall from his steadfastness and commit any one of these sins mentioned in the Bible? Well, the obvious answer is yes. This is why we are tempted because we can fall to any one of them because we are but flesh. We still live in this sinful body, this sinful nature that we have. Paul makes it clear though in Romans 7, there is a spiritual warfare between the spirit and the flesh and a believer doesn't always win that battle. And especially if he or she is a new believer. Of course, you can do the same thing as an adult. Another question, have you ever had to ask God for forgiveness after you were born again? If so, it's because you sinned. Whether it was the sin of commission, the sin of omission, secret sin, presumptuous sin, whatever it was, you sinned after you were born again. It doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It just means you needed to repent and make it right with God. Notice Romans 7, 21 through 23. I find then a principle that in me evil is present who wants or desires to do good. For I joyfully concur or agree with the law of God in the inner man. But... I see a different law in my members. What's it doing? Waging war against the law of my mind. What else does it do? It makes me captive to the law of sin, which is in my members. So what this means is we are at war with our flesh, 
And each battle is won or lost based upon whether or not we have surrendered as believers to the control of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're supposed to do as believers. We're not only at war with our flesh, but at war with the world and the God of this world, which is Satan, the devil. As 1 Peter 5.8 tells us, he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. All right, look at Galatians 5.16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. It's clear, isn't it? We must live through the Spirit. Verse 17, for the flesh... Uh, uh, lust is, for the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are in opposition one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would so verse 16 is saying if you live under the influence of the Holy Spirit submit and yield to him instead of your flesh you will be able to overcome understand I'm, I'm not saying the unregenerate person can do this because they cannot. I'm speaking of those who have been born again. A believer has the ability through and by the Holy Spirit to mortify the deeds of the body. But that doesn't mean he or she always will. And that's found in Romans 8. Um, Romans 6, 12 and 13 says this, Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Remember, as a believer, you're capable of doing that. Because of your sinful flesh. Sin is present, but you are not to let it rule. Okay? What this is saying to believers is don't let sin have the rule of your life to make you obey its passions. That's what you were and what you did before you were born again. Okay? As believers, we're to mortify or kill the deeds of the body. If we don't do that, we are likely to. To sin. Notice he says, let not sin rule in your mortal body. Okay? Paul knew the flesh was weak and is liable to be overcome by temptation if our members, our flesh, yields to its influences. Okay? All right, why do you think Satan tempts us? His goal is to get us to disobey God as he did to Adam and Eve. He knows we are but flesh and can and will sin if we don't yield to the Holy Spirit's control. And friends, that is the spiritual warfare. Okay? In Ephesians 6, we are admonished to put on the whole armor of God so that we'll be able to stand against the uh, schemes and the tricks of the devil. Notice Romans 6.13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to what? To sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Okay? Friends, we must understand he's speaking to believers. So this idea in holiness churches that believe once you're born again, you don't ever sin anymore, or you've been entire, you, you can be entirely sanctified, or that Christian perfection is attainable and you just won't sin, or that once you're saved, there's no reason you would ever have to repent, is just not biblical. Now, we're not making an excuse for believers to do whatever they want to do recklessly in their life. That is not what we're saying. This is not a lesson for license to sin. The fact is, the more the believer grows spiritually in Christ and matures, he will sin less. Okay? On the other hand, do I believe a believer can go a day without sinning? Absolutely. Okay? Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 15, 10 and 11. He called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Now, as we've said before, these are two words of great importance. Hear and understand. Very important. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a person, but that which comes out of the mouth. 
that defiles a person. Now, this clearly demonstrates the corruption lies within the body. The sin lies within, which explains Paul's writing in chapter 7 of Romans, where he said, sin is present in me. Now, the opposition to the doctrine of the Pharisees, Jesus took the opportunity to show them that the great source of pollution is the human heart. Now, the Pharisees believed in external purification, okay? Now, just like many in the holiness movement today, they believe that the outward, the external, provides some type of fruit of cleansing or proof that a person is holy. But we see here, Jesus directs the Pharisee, to the true source of defilement. It was their own hearts, okay? That which is within. You could be praying in the altar. You could be faithful as anyone, participating faithfully in the functions of the church, and all the outward show is not always a sign that a person is born again, right? The distinction must be made between what is good works and righteous fruit because there is a difference which brings up the question, is the outward or external a valid test of truth? Can it be used as a valid test of truth? Well, the answer is no. Jesus made that clear in Matthew 23, 25 through 28. Read, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence, okay? You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and plate that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs without, or which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Very important scriptures for the holiness movement. So, you can be the outward external holiness look of what Pentecostalists define holiness to be and still be defiled in heart. Why? Because the pollution comes from within. Now, many Pentecostal churches understand this clearly, okay? Many Pentecostals understand this clearly. But the holiness movement seems to not understand this at all. And again, I repeat, for those of you who have accused me of putting Pentecostals in the same boat, I assure you, I am not doing that. All Pentecostals are not like this. Not all Pentecostal persuasions believe the same as the holiness movement that I was raised in when it speaks of the outward and external. It doesn't excuse other Pentecostals, though, because they still believe they are speaking in a heavenly language in their ecstatic speech in gibberish when they're not. So it doesn't excuse them, but all Pentecostals don't believe the same. All right, so here we have the disciples. They were charged with being sinners for transgressing the tradition of the elders because they ate without washing their hands. Notice this was Pharisaic. This was a man-made doctrine, okay? In, in holiness, there is a lot of man-made doctrines. Um, Jesus made it clear, though, to them, they're not defiled for taking food in the body with dirty hands. They're not defiled by what goes in the mouth, but by what comes out of it. As Paul states in Romans 7, verse 17 and 20, sin dwells within us, in our nature, in our body, and what proceeds from the human heart itself is what defiles us. Jesus ex explains further in verse 16 through 20. Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, um, uh, theft, slander. These are what defiles a person. 
but to eat with unwashing hands does not defile anyone. Now, in the holiness movement, they say this is not speaking to the believer once he is born again because he takes on a new nature and his heart has been changed. So he forsakes those sins and doesn't sin anymore. Well, we agree the believer does have a new disposition. He does have a transformed heart and he doesn't desire the things of the world that he desired before. The things he hated, he now loves, and the things he loved, he now hates because he is a new creation in Christ. We, we believe in all of that. But the point here is man is defiled by his own nature, okay? Man is totally depraved because of the sin that is inbred in him from birth. It is the Adamic nature brought about by our fallen predecessor, Adam. Paul says, as a believer, the child of God delights in the truth. But it doesn't mean he will always do what is right. Why? Because he has a sinful nature. And it must be brought under subjection. So if he doesn't yield to the Holy Spirit's control, his anger can turn into hate, his hate into murder. And if he does not yield his members to God. You might say, how's that possible for a believer? The Bible clearly states it's possible because of the human fallen nature. We do not yet have glorified bodies. If we're not yielding to the Holy Spirit's control, we are yielding then to the flesh. This is why Paul states in Romans 7, 21 through 23, I want to read this again. I find then a law that when I would do good, Evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God of the inner man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay, so we, we must also understand Paul is speaking here as a believer himself. Okay, He was not speaking as an unconverted man because sinners who have not been born again do not delight in the law of God. They can't delight in the law of God because the carnal mind opposes God. Romans 8, 7 makes that clear for us. So for a believer, sin is present, but sin is no longer president of that life. For the unbeliever, sin is present and president. And he doesn't have the power to keep the moral law of God because he is not born again, Romans 8, 7. Again, the believer who is saved and has been born of the Spirit, sin is present but no longer president. And he, through the Holy Spirit, has the power to keep the moral law of God where the unbeliever cannot. Friends, because of our sinful nature at any moment, at any time, if a believer does not submit himself to the control of the Holy Spirit and resist temptation, these sins will come out of him because sin is present in his body. So can a believer sin? Yes. Should he sin? No. And that is what the Apostle John was seeking to communicate. So let's look at 1 John chapter 3, 4 and 5 here, all right? We've learned that all sin is a violation of the law of God. That's what he says. And the intention and purpose of God was to deliver his people through Christ from sin, okay? Then when we come to verses 6 to 8, we see it's clear that those who are true Christians do not habitually sin. That's what John is saying. Um... No one who abides in Christ keeps on sinning. And this is referring to a habitual sin. Remember that. The apostles referring to the person in whom there's been no change. He may be professing to be a Christian, but the only the unregenerate habitually sin. Okay? Only unbelievers habitually sin. Habitual means constant, continual, chronic, abiding sin. And those who habitually sin are not true Christians. 
but are living for and are controlled by the devil. And that is the unregenerate. That is who John is clearly talking about here in the chapter. Now, John makes the distinction because no doubt there were those who were professing Christ. But in um, the life that they were living, there had been no change. And we have many today who profess to be Christians. But in their life, there you cannot see a change. There's been no change. There's no fruit. We believe the Bible teaches if you are born again, there is a change. There is a transformation that takes place where in your life you produce righteous fruit. And if you're not producing righteous fruit, you have not been born of the Spirit. Okay? All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This is what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Romans 2, 29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. All right, look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, okay? Notice John says it again. Those who are born from above or born again do not habitually sin. Now, this is not saying to the believer that once you are born again, you are spiritually perfect and never will commit any sin. That is not what it's talking about. Nor is chapter 3 of 1 John teaching Christian perfection which many people believe, okay? Go back to chapter 2 and hear what the apostle says in verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin, okay? It's not God's will that we sin. It's transgression. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So here we have the apostle uh, the, his intent to explain and declare to believers that it is God's will that we don't sin. God hates sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. However, if anyone does sin, however it happened in their life, remember, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So whether it was the sin of commission, the sin of omission, presumptuous sin, secret sin, if he is sorry for that sin, he asks forgiveness and the Lord forgives him of that sin. I've stated many times this question. Can a good soldier who is faithful in the battle and has proven his loyalty to his country and has fought for the right when fallen in battle and wounded, struggle to get back where he was before. Is that possible? The answer is yes. And so it is with a soldier in the army of the Lord because we are not perfect. Sometimes believers struggle with sin and it takes time in the battle to overcome and learn the lessons that will help us not to do it again. Okay? These are the lessons learned as infants to adults. And even then, adults being mature can sin if they're not crucifying the flesh daily. And according to Jeremiah 17, with hearts as corrupt as ours in the midst of the temptations of the world, the apostle knew it was possible to sin. It wasn't proper to as a believer, but it was possible, okay? The believer was not to lose heart or hope that there would be no forgiveness because there was forgiveness. And the reason there was is because our great advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, he bore our sins at Calvary. Thank you, Lord, for that. And we confide in you, Lord, and what you did on the cross and your glorious resurrection for our victory. I'm grateful for that, and you should be too. Now, in context, in the previous chapter, John 1, 8, the Bible says if we say we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, we must understand John is speaking to believers. Remember that. In this short verse, John is reminding believers 
of a couple different things. Okay, John 1, 8. Evidently, there were those who were professing they were not guilty of sin. And also those who professed to be perfectly sanctified as to live without it. Okay? In both professions, the apostles said they were deceiving themselves. Not only were they deceiving themselves, but the truth wasn't in them. Okay? That's a fact. Now, this is something to pay close attention to. One writer said it this way, No one knows himself who supposes or assumes he or she is perfectly pure. Okay? If we believe we are not sinners, as Romans 3 tells us we are, we are deceived. And if we believe we have any righteousness or holiness of our own, we are deceived. Okay? Another writer said this, He who maintains that he is perfectly sanctified and lives without any sin shows that he is deceived in regard to himself and that the truth in this respect is not in him. He goes on to say, A person who claims that he is absolutely perfect, that he is holy as God is holy, must know little of his own heart. Friends, as believers, um, we have imputed righteousness. There is no righteousness or holiness of us, but that which has been imputed by Christ. Do we understand that? So when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ, not our holiness but the righteousness of Christ. The human heart and mind have been so elevated in this generation that many believe that they are the very carbon copy of the Almighty. Friends, we are fallen creatures who deserve the wrath of God. Man beside of God is the difference between darkness and light, even as a believer. What does Romans 12.3 say? We're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But to think what? To think soberly. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice verse 10, which is why John said what he said in chapter 2, verse 1. Notice verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, many in Pentecostalism, especially in the holiness movement, have been inclined to say this, that they have no sin. And it is because of their belief system which teaches that, and also, I believe, because of their pride. I really do. But the apostle makes it clear if a man should make the claim that his past life had been perfectly upright, it would prove that he is deceiving himself. Many of the Jews felt this way because they believed they had kept the law of God. They were Jews. The law was given to them. But Jesus made it clear to Nicodemus, didn't he? A ruler in Israel. You must be born again or you're never going to enter the kingdom of God. That's just one example. But the writer continues, If a person should claim to be perfect or to be perfectly sanctified, he would demonstrate that he has deceived himself. So the two statements go to prove that neither in reference to the past nor the present can anyone lay claim to perfection. The bottom line is God said all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So to say we haven't sinned is to say God's lying. And if this is the case, his word doesn't dwell in us. All right, let's turn our attention to repentance now, okay? Uh, what is repentance and how is it used in scripture in regard to sin, okay? All right, let me say right here, this will not be a complete lesson on sin now or, or repentance or backsliding, but verses observed to demonstrate that believers do not lose their salvation 
because they fell to temptation or they sinned. Okay? That's what we're trying to convey. All right, Strong's definition of the word repent in the Old Testament Hebrew is the word naham, which means to sigh, breathe strongly, to be sorry. The word repentance is the Hebrew word noham, which means to be mournful or regretful. Okay? In the New Testament, the Greek word for repent is met, metanoeo, something like that, which means to think differently, to change one's mind. Okay? Two other Greek words used in the New Testament to express repentance um, is the verb, and I don't know if I can pronounce this, metameloma or something like that. This means a change of mind such as to produce regret or even remorse on account of sin, but not necessarily a change of heart. This would be used uh, as a reference to the repentance of Judas in Matthew 27, 3. Okay? Secondly, the Greek word metanoa is used of true repentance, a change of mind and purpose in life to which forgiveness of sin is promised. So repentance consists of four elements. It consists of a true sense of one's own guilt and sinfulness. As David tells us in uh, the psalmist David in 51 verse 2 and 3, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I acknowledge my transgressions. Okay. Number two, repentance consists of an understanding of God's mercy in Christ. As the psalmist David said in 51 verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And number three, repentance consists of an actual hatred of sin and turning from it to God. Um, Psalms 119, 128, Therefore I esteem all your precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. And number four, repentance consists of a persistent endeavor to live a holy life in walking with God in the way of his commandments. Okay? There are many places in Scripture, but let me just give you one place in Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. This is what it said. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the passion of lusts like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger. And all of these things, as we told you before, and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but in sanctification. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So here's the question for the holiness movement. Is repentance a one-time thing for believers or do we practice repentance on a daily basis? Okay. Since repentance is a sense of one's own guilt and understanding of God's mercy in Christ and is an actual hatred of sin and since it's turning from sin to God, since it's a persistent endeavor to live a holy life and walking in the way of God's commandments, then yes, it is a daily exercise or, or action where we humble ourselves before God and plead for the Holy Spirit to sanctify us and make us like Christ. And he does this on a daily basis as we yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Folks, that is our sanctification. So you see, repentance doesn't mean you're getting saved all over again as a believer or that you have lost the gift of salvation, or the promises, or eternal life, or anything that God has given to you by your 
at your conversion, whatever he's given. God doesn't abandon his children, friends. He doesn't take away his promises because you sinned. God's part is to chasten us and discipline us as believers. When we sin, our part is to repent and turn from it. Repentance is godly sorrow. It means you're sorrow, sorry for sinning against a holy God. 2 Corinthians 7. Not, verse 9 and 10. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly sorrow, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly sorrow produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret whereas worldly sorrow produces death. Now, I know this may be a little comical for some, but it's serious to, to, to the holiness movement. One day I asked a man in the holiness movement if he had ever repented since he was born again. And he said, no. I said, so you've been that good? And he said, yeah, as far as I know. Friends, this is the problem we are dealing with in the evangelical world. Um especially in the Pentecostal holiness movements. People don't know who they really are in the light of Scripture. And as R.C. has said many times, they don't know who God is. That's R.C. Sproul. They have skipped over two essentials, he said, two essential doctrines, the doctrine of man and the doctrine of God. And uh, I want to say right here that... Um, the doctrine of sin has not been efficiently taught and understood, and I believe that's the reason for a lot of ignorance. The problem in the evangelical world is we don't know who we are, and we don't know who God is. And in the holiness movement especially, they don't know their own sinfulness. I've talked with these people. They don't know the holiness of God as they claim they do. Because they have a low view of God. And my heart goes out to those who have not discovered the word of God in its meaning. In expository preaching. But have followed year after year the rules, regulations, and traditions of man-made standards. And sermons to supposedly meet their spiritual needs. And they really believe they're having church when they go to church. Friends, when I learned the meaning of Scripture through expository preaching, it changed my life. It changed my wife's life. It showed us our unworthiness, our sin, our total depravity that we didn't even know about before. And this is not just my testimony, but thousands of others have witnessed the same reality and have come out of the Pentecostal persuasions because of the movement's lack of spiritual validity and true exposition by the way let me stop here and say i recommend two books on the holiness of god rc sproul his book on the holiness of god and jc ryle's book on holiness all right um i begin to understand paul's plea and desire that i may know him and the power of his resurrection the fellowship of his sufferings Friends, to know him is the goal, to know God. The question is, who is he? And how can we know him? Well, first we must be born from above. We must be born again, truly born again. And then from that time on, it is to know God's word. And you do that by learning its meaning. That's when you truly grow. What's the Spirit's intent? What did, what did the Holy Spirit say? What did he mean? And in the process of time, you come to know the Lord. And as many godly men have stated, it takes a lifetime to know God. It takes a lifetime to become a good soldier. All right, let's look at some verses here about repentance. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. Um, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the message was, Repent. That's what they were to do. Jesus' message was the same, a call to repentance. The sinner was to understand the way in which he was living. 
was the way of death and the way of hell. And to continue living in sin and disobedience and rebellion was to provoke and insult a living, righteous, holy God. So they were to flee from the wrath to come by looking to the provided remedy that, and that was God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks of repentance in Luke 13, 1 through 5. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answers them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? He says, No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 of whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Jesus said, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus makes it clear. They had come to the wrong conclusion about the men who died. The fact that people come to a sudden and violent death is not proof that they are especially wicked. Okay, The message was, and the point was to understand, all are sinners and all need to turn from sin to a living God. You must be born again or you will perish. John chapter 3 verse 16 says that. All right, look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. The question was asked, what must we do? Um, in so many words, what must we do then? Peter says, repent and be baptized and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 3, 19, Peter says, I know, brothers, that you acted in ignorance by putting Christ to death, but God through Christ is willing to show to you mercy. So he says, repent and turn back. They were to turn from the course of wickedness in which they and the nation had been so long walking in order for their sins to be forgiven. Let's look at Acts 17 verse 30. Peter says the times of ignorance God uh, overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. Notice here, repentance is a command, not a suggestion. Meaning he allowed man to walk in his own ways at the time without really punishing them or he withheld judgment. But now he commands not only the Jews, but everyone everywhere to repent. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 5, notice Christ reminds them of the condition in which they once were. He says, remember from whence you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. All right, so all of these things on repentance, but here's where I want to speak on backsliding, um, falling away or apostatizing, Okay. First thing I want you to notice here in Revelation, these people um, believed in Christ. They were believers. They were the church of Ephesus. In verse 2, he commends them for their patience and their opposition to those who were evil, for their zeal and fidelity and carefully examining the character of those who claimed to be apostles but who were in fact not apostles. He commended them for their perseverance and bearing up under trial and not feigning in his cause. But this is what he says. I have something against you. You have abandoned your first love. He's got something against them. Notice they belong to Christ. They are believers. They are the church. But they have fallen. Okay? The Greek word is ekpipto which means to fall away, to be driven out, to become inefficient, okay? All right, the word backslider, backsliding, and the plural backslidings is found in the Bible 17 times. And with this word is also the word backward, 
which demonstrates in some passages the same idea. Now the actual word backslider, backsliding and backslidings, are found in three books, Proverbs, Jeremiah, and Hosea. Okay, those three, those three books. But there are other references that can be observed also to express the same intention. Words like turn back in Zephaniah 1.6, departing from in Hebrew 3.12, the word turn from or turn to in 2 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22. All these word phrases are words to mean falling away, rebellious, stubborn, apostatizing, abandonment, desertion, leaving, forsaking, going, backward, defection, disloyal, and disobedient. All those words. And there are other words, uh, phrases in Deuteronomy, like depart from and forgetfulness. In Job 34, the word is turn back. Ezekiel 3.20, turning from righteousness. Matthew 24 speaks of growing cold. Luke 9 speaks of looking back. Galatians speaks of being soon removed, bewitched, and turning again. 1 Timothy speaks of having put away, turned aside, or erred from the truth or, or from the faith. In the book of Hebrews, the words are departing from, falling away, sinning willfully, drawing back, and the word fail. In 2 Peter 1.9, we have the word lacketh and forgotten. And in Jude and Revelation um, chapter 2, we have the word left. Okay? All of these verses express or indicate a departure from God's intended purpose for his people, okay? Which is why the word backsliding or falling away or apostasy is used for someone who goes astray. All right, now listen carefully. We must understand there are different scenarios for going astray or falling away or the word apostasy, okay? One scenario speaks of the unbeliever. The other speaks of the believer. One is when a true believer has been disobedient by sliding back into some old habits. The battle's raging. He's in a spiritual warfare. Satan is zeroing in on him. And he has fallen back into sin. Okay? His or her prayer life has become slack. Their attention to the things of God are blurred. It is a time when the believer is being a disobedient son or a disobedient daughter. As a believer in this condition, a person just needs to repent, not to be saved all over again. As a believer, the person doesn't lose their faith or salvation. They have only lost sight of their faith and salvation. So the true believer will always repent and come back to God. We must understand a born-again believer will never abandon the faith. Neither will the Lord abandon his children. Okay? A born-again believer will always return from his backslidings and repent and be restored. Listen carefully. When Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law and made us new creations through Christ, in regeneration, justification, sanctification, and glorification, He gave us eternal life. And eternal means eternal. Someone who has been born again and born from above and has been redeemed, bought and paid for, has been given an eternal inheritance. The believer will never lose what God has promised and gave him. And as a believer, eternal life is not based upon our own works. It is established on the person of Christ and what he did on the cross and the glorious resurrection and the promises of God. Salvation is a free gift from God. Nothing you can do or anyone else can do can separate you from God or his promises. Read Romans 8, 29 through 39. If you think for one moment 
You are the one keeping and maintaining your salvation. Think again. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5. through 5, This is what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Friends, our salvation is kept by the power of God. Notice John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me, notice that, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Bible tells us in John 6, verse 37, notice what it says. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whosoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So the first scenario is a believer backsliding when he is disobedient. But the fact is, because he is born again, and he is a true believer, he will eventually repent and return to God. He doesn't lose his salvation. He just needs to repent of his heart's defection. All right, now the other scenario is where the person is attending church and he is participating in the functions of the church. Everyone looks at him or her as a believer. The person may even profess to be a believer, but they are not true believers. The person is a tear among the wheat, but no one really knows it at the time. Because of the person's profession and his outward. Many like this are born in the church. And because of their upbringing, being raised in the church all their life, it is assumed they are Christian. But these same individuals have never really truly been born again. Okay, These individuals eventually fall away. Most of the time they leave the church and live a life of habitual sin. They don't always leave the church, but... 1 John 2.19 tells us, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become clear that they were not of us. They didn't belong to us. When a person abandons Christ, the church, the faith, it demonstrates they never had faith. So this scenario is the unbeliever, the person we describe as the apostate, okay? The book of Jude, and this is a long thing to do here, but the book of Jude describes apostasy. Apostasy is not easily detected because it slips in and for a while assumes a part of the body, but it is a tear among the wheat. It's a disguise, as Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, false teachers, preachers are this way. Apostates, as false teachers, will twist the scriptures to fit their own agenda. And we see that also in the book of Jude. Okay? In the book of Jude, apostates are described as, number one, ungodly. Number two, morally perverted. And those who deny Christ. Now, that's in verse 4. In verse 8, they defile the flesh. They are rebellious people who revile angels and who really don't know God. In verse 10, we have that they proclaim false visions and are self-destructive. In verse 16, they are murmurers and grumblers walking after their own lust. They're arrogant and they use false flattery. In verse 18 those who cause divisions. In verse 19, it's the worldly-minded 
those who are devoid of the Spirit, which means they are unsaved, they're unbelievers. All right, the book of Titus, chapter 1, speaks of the apostate. The Bible says in verse 15, To the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and believing nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Verse 16, They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. All right, so I read those things to say this. A true believer will never apostatize. A true believer may fall away, but he will always repent and turn to God. The person that apost apostatizes is the professing believer who took part or attached himself to the body of Christ, heard the word preached, had a certain amount of knowledge of God, but who was never really born again or never a real living part of the body of Christ. So when you see scriptures like 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, that says the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience here with a hot iron, it is speaking of the apostate not the true believer, okay? Understand that. The meaning is they would fall away from the truth of the gospel by adhering to deceiving spirits and information of demons. It doesn't mean in the last days that some true believers will lose their faith and do that because true believers won't do that. Other scriptures like Hebrews 6, 4 is not speaking of a true believer backsliding and losing his or her salvation. The words enlightened, tasted, partakers is speaking of the apostate that had received instruction in biblical truth with a certain amount of knowledge gained as to intellectual perception. But this is not speaking of a believer who loses his salvation. Neither is Hebrews 10.26 speaking of backsliding and losing one's salvation. It's not what it's speaking about. It is speaking about the apostate who continues in habitual sin. How do we know this? Because of verse 39 of the same chapter, which says believers are not those who fall away and are destroyed, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. This is another place where the Bible is not speaking of backsliding and losing one's salvation. Okay? Look at verse 20. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are in, again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it, it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness. Notice that. Knowledge of the way of righteousness. Then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Notice again the word knowledge. Okay? Notice that word in these verses. Look at verse 22. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to his own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. All right, listen carefully here, friends. Remember, context is the key. Okay, context. This whole chapter is dealing with false teachers and those who follow them. Peter begins by saying there will be false teachers among the church as it was in ancient times. These false teachers would introduce error, leading many astray. And these apostates would not go unpunished. As God didn't spare the angels that sinned, nor the people during the flood, nor Sodom and Gomorrah, He will not allow apostates or their followers 
to escape his judgment. Okay? This is what's being said here. Peter describes false prophets and those who follow them. He speaks of false teachers and those who profess Christianity. He is not speaking of true believers who have true Christianity. He is speaking of professing believers who are actually apostates. Now, before I go further, we must remember that Peter is speaking to both Jew and Gentile, to all who have obtained like precious faith. I think it always helps uh, when he was writing these letters. I think it al always helps to understand the writer more fully, more fully when, he, uh, when we understand the ones in whom he was formerly speaking to. Let me give you an example. If you take the book of Hebrews, the letter was written to, to the Hebrews. Okay, do you understand that? He, it was written to the Hebrews. He was addressing the Hebrews. Doesn't mean the letter is not for Gentiles. It just means it was formerly written to the Jews. Okay? The writer to the Hebrews, whoever that was, addresses three different groups of Jewish people, which helps us to understand much of who he is talking about in different passages of the letter. And John MacArthur um, help me understand this. Now, we know these three groups of Jewish people existed because of what we see not only in the scriptures, but in our Jewish history. The first group are Hebrew Christians who suffered rejection and persecution by fellow Jews. Okay? The second group are Jewish un unbelievers who were convinced of the truths of the gospel, but who had not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, they were intellectually persuaded but not committed. The third group were Jewish unbelievers who had exposure to gospel truth but were not convinced of it. So when we read chapter 2 of 2 Peter, verses 20 through 22, remember context and to whom the chapter is writing about. He's writing about the apostates. He's writing about apostasy. He's not speaking to believers, true believers, losing some time down the road their salvation. John MacArthur writes in the MacArthur Study Bible, Peter notes that at some time these false teachers and their followers wanted to escape the moral contamination of the world system and sought religion, even Jesus, on their own terms, not his. But these false teachers had never genuinely been converted to Christ. They heard the true gospel, yes, and moved toward it. But they then rejected Christ, and that is apostasy. Notice in verse 22, the dog and the sow. Believers, friends, believers are not referenced as dogs and sows. Unbelievers are, okay? Apostates are. So just so you know, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, is speaking of the unbelieving apostate, the professing believer who falls away. Judas is a great example, one who knew the truth and had knowledge of the truth but rejected it. He's a great example of the apostate. Look at Galatians 5.4, okay? Galatians 5.4 is used by many as backsliding and losing your salvation, but this is not the meaning here again, okay? The scripture says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, many will say, you see there, you can fall from grace, right? There it is. So a believer can lose his salvation. Well, the phrase doesn't mean that if a Christian sins, he falls from grace and thereby loses his salvation. It doesn't mean that. If you'll study it in the proper hermeneutical way, the meaning is if you think you can be justified by works, you are being driven off course. You're, you're drifting away from the truth. It is definitely a sign of defection and backsliding, yes. But as a believer, you don't lose your salvation. If you are only a professing believer, 
where there has been no transformation of heart and you are believing in heresies and being led astray by false teachers because you truly don't know the Lord, it would be apostasy. Okay? Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. Now, what is believed here is that this is a proof text that your name can be in the book of life and then be taken out. Evidence, then, that you can, as a believer, remain in the book, and then when you backslide, become an unbeliever, your name is removed from the book. Friends, this again is a misunderstanding of Scripture. The idea here, in context, is a bold, clear statement in verse 4 that there were a few names which had not defiled their garments. They're children of God. They're worthy to be confessed before my Father and the angels. That's what he was saying. Verse 5 declares these people are the ones who had overcome, whose name would not, or not, uh, would be, not be taken out of the book of life. Friends, there is no context here that speaks of defection in a believer's life warranting the removal of his name from the book. But a promise that Jesus will not do that to the believer. We're not placed in the kingdom by what we do or don't do. We are placed into the kingdom and our names written down because Christ chose us from the foundation of the world and called us unto himself and adopted us into the family of God to be his children. You see? Salvation and our inheritance and eternal life is not merited by what we do or don't do. It is by grace through faith alone that we are saved and that not of ourselves. It is the free gift of God, not of works, lest we should boast. Now, we're not saying that works aren't essential. Of course they are. But we're not saved or kept by works. We're saved by God's grace through faith. Salvation is not the result of our works. But we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay? Friends, God has given you eternal life. And if you are a believer, He has regenerated, justified, and glorified you. You were saved, you are being saved, and you ultimately will be saved when you receive your glorified body. And until then, we are to seek the face of God in effectual fervent prayer, live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, look for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who redeemed us from all iniquity, and he purified unto himself a peculiar people. These are times in the spiritual warfare that you're going to struggle with sin, the flesh and the devil, and the battle for a soldier is never easy, but if you are a true soldier, though you are struggling with sin, if you are born again, you have an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. But I also want to give you a word of warning. If you are a professing believer, and you are in the church participating in its functions, and you are habitually sinning against God, you will face judgment, and your eternal fate will be burning in the lake of fire forever. So it is vital. We know who we are and we know who God is. If you are a believer, you have the promise of Philippians 1.6. 
being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you are a professing believer, and yet you are living in both realms, I also have a promise for you. Revelation 21, 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, you will have your part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In closing, I want to say again, this is not every scripture there is on the false belief that you can lose your salvation. But these have been used to show that those who hold to a belief that a believer can lose his salvation, it's just a false teaching. It's just not what the Bible is saying. And it is the false teaching of the holiness movement and, and some Pentecostal movements. It is an Arminian Wesleyan view and it is a misuse of proper hermeneutics. Hopefully you have a better understanding of, of sin and backsliding to know that a believer never apostatizes. Only the unbeliever does because believers are kept by the power of God. Professing believers, they're not kept by the power of God. They attach themselves to the body of Christ without ever being a part of it. That, my friends, is what is called religion, not Christianity. Until next time, may we not only learn the meaning of Scripture, but that we would apply the Scripture and exemplify Christ in our lives. God bless you.